in his purpose to select and train his church as his companion. The entire universe is ordered and for that one purpose. For all things belong to the church and are for her benefit. Now according to Romans chapter 8, that's the total objective, the single solitary motive of all God's creative acts. This passage teaches us clearly that all that God has been doing from the very beginning is focused upon the church. Therefore, it was not for their own intrinsic importance that Pharaoh, Nebuchadnezzar, Darius, Sennacherib, and others were raised up. These kings derived their significance completely from their relationship to God's purpose for the Messianic nation, through whom God, through whom the Messiah was to come. And someday we will understand that not only these biblically recorded instances, but all events from all eternity were ordered and directed for one purpose and one purpose only, the eventual winning and preparation of the church, the bride of Christ. That's you. And that's me. And that's all who are the redeemed of the Lord. And with that one in mind, that everything from creation points to the church, the bride of Christ, we have to ask the question, what was God's purpose for the church? <clears throat> Redeemed humanity really occupies a, a unique position in the hierarchy of the universe. What I'm about to say, uh, in no attempt whatever to depreciate the rank of angels, nor to lessen the radiant splendor of their glory. For angels are indescribably beautiful. They are unspeakably majestic. They are unutterably powerful. And they are supernaturally intelligent. They rule the celestial domains of untold magnitude and of inconceivable grandeur. And their dazzling rank is seen by the fact that they surround the very throne of God and they constitute the court of the King of Kings. Now, all that said, exalted as angels are, catch this, the highest ranking angel hovering over the throne of God is outranked by the most insignificant human <coughs> being who has been born again, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, redeemed humanity, created originally in the image of God, has been elevated by means of a new birth to the highest rank of all created beings. Hebrews 2.16 says, the Son came not to help angels. He came to help the descendants of Abraham. Now, Paul Goheimer, in his book, Destined for the Throne, wrote, however else he might manifest himself in nature, God could not become incarnate in angels because they are not created in the full image of God. No other created being approaches the capacity of a human being to contain and to utter God. Only God, only man has a nature in which God can become incarnate. And by this, he dignified the human race, elevated redeemed humanity beyond the highest ranking angelic star in the radiant canopy of the earth. And because angels have, were not made in the image of God, God could not therefore become incarnate in them. The fallen angels cannot be redeemed. No angel can ever become the congenital member of the family of God. They are created beings, not the generated beings. Therefore, no angel can become a blood-born son of God. 
Angels can never have a heritage, the genes of God. They can never be partakers of divine nature. Again, Paul Bilheimer wrote, God has exalted humanity, redeemed humanity, to such a sublime uh, uh, rank that it is impossible for him to elevate them any further without actually bringing them into the very inner circle of the Godhead itself. We read in uh, the 8th Psalm, verses 3, 4, and 5, these words. When I look at the night sky and see the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars you set in place, what are mere mortals that you should think about them? Human beings that you should care for them. Yet you made them only a little lower than God and crowned him with glory and honor. Did you hear that? A little lower than God. According to recognized authority, that is the correct translation, since the term used in the original Hebrew is Elohim, which is the first of the names of deity. I recognize the fact that the King James, as wonderful as it is, made that one at least one bad translation. I remember sitting in Dr. Wayne Noble King's class 50 years ago when he quoted that scripture and said, that is a mistake. Elohim refers to God, not to angels. So you and I were made a little lower, not of angels. We're above angels, a little lower than God. Now in this portion of the study, I, I, I've been trying to make it as clear as I can of our spiritual standing with our Heavenly Father. Do you, do you catch the significance of that? We, we're the goal of sacred history, the church, the bride of Christ, his eternal companion. Now, going back here, Calvary is the center of, of, of history. The church is the object and goal of history. Bring me to my third point. The tremendous price that Jesus, that Jesus paid for the church. The church. That's you, and that's me. And anyone who accept personally what he did for them, what he paid. And that's the question here is the thought of Jesus actually spending time in hell. Not just in the grave, but in the hell that the Bible speaks about. Is that thought repugnant to you? Do you reject the thought that Jesus, the Son of God, God himself, would ever actually spend time in hell? I mean, that while there, he would be subject to the very same fires of hell that any other sinner faces, that the same torment that the most hideous sinner, sinner of all time would suffer? Does some find that thought inconceivable and, and would insist that would never happen? Well, will you think with me for just a little bit here? Because in 2 Corinthians 5.21, he was made sin. He was impregnated with sin and became the very essence of sin on that cross. He was banished from God's presence as a repulsive thing. He and sin were made synonymous. And in order to become our valid substitute, he was compelled to satisfy the claims of justice by himself alone against the cumulative sin of the whole world as if he were actually guilty of the sum total of that sin. 